That's good. Does somebody want to start off with a word of praise or a testimony or a, something good that happened to you this week? Anybody? <laughs> well, there you go. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Okay, well, why don't we start with a word of prayer? Jeff, would you like to lead us in a word of prayer? Uh, Heavenly Father, we just give you praise um, that we could all gather under the name of Jesus. And um, Lord, that we can say that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and uh, Lord, we just uh, ask for your blessing tonight, God, that we would hear your words. You would speak through Ron. Uh, and God, speak through your word tonight. And God, just touch all of our hearts and let us leave here having learned something new and uh, something fresh and, uh, from you, God, from your spirit. So we just ask uh, right now, God, for your blessing. We say thank you for this time. It's, a, it's an honor, Lord, to sit here and learn from your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what I want to talk about tonight is I'd like to talk about some things that the Bible says about our loved ones in heaven. You know, we, we can't personally see or hear uh, what our loved ones are doing in heaven. Uh, God has revealed many wonderful things, uh, re realities about heaven and the Bible. Uh, so here are some things about our loved ones in heaven. Uh, we all wonder what heaven is like and what our deceased loved ones are doing in heaven, what they're doing there. God's Word, the Bible serves as a primary source and a guidance and an assurance on what happens to our loved ones after they pass away. The Bible doesn't provide every detail about heaven and the state of our loved ones there, but it does offer valuable insights that provide important glimpses of the divine plan for believers in heaven. It also assures us in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10, that what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. And even though we can't personally see or hear what our loved ones are doing in heaven, God has revealed many wonderful realities about heaven in the Bible. So tonight I'd like to share some of those things with you, and I hope that you hear God in this as much as I have. I really have. Uh, when I started doing this, I didn't realize how much I um, was preaching to myself, too. You know, I, I, needed, I needed this, and I'm glad God brought it to my attention. Eternal life. And the promise of heaven. The Bible offers a profound promise of eternal life in heaven. For those who have faith in Jesus Christ, it assures us in John 3.16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is the source of great comfort for us while we grieve our loved ones who have passed away. All the people grieving who have put their trust in Jesus for salvation have the promise of eternal life. This foundational belief also gives us hope as fellow believers for reuniting with, one, with our loved ones in heaven when our earthly lives have ended here as well. To be absent from the body, but present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5.8. It offers insight into the state of believers. When their earthly lives are over, we are confident. And I say would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. This also suggests that when believers die, we are immediately in the presence of Jesus. It it convinces us that our loved ones, when they're taken from this world, 
if they're saved, will be with the Lord in heaven. While their bodies, while their absence creates a painful void in our lives, we can encourage the fact, and we can be encouraged by the fact that we are enjoying, that they are enjoying God's presence. And we can also be inspired, which inspires us to look at our own lives and what is waiting for us when we go to be with the Lord. Bear with me a second. Okay. Jesus provided comforting words about heaven in John 14, 2 and 3. He said, in my father's house, there are many rooms, many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me that you may also be where I am. Being there um, uh, with our loved ones, isn't, being, being without our loved ones isn't easy. It should give us a strong sense of uh, Jesus, a personal, uh, a personal connection with the Lord for all of us if we have a relationship with him. Jesus knows what each of us need and carefully uh, prepares a place for each of us in heaven. We can trust that our loved ones have the very best heavenly home and when we visit their grave or other final resting places, it can be inspiring to think where their souls are in heaven right now and with the Lord. I've, I've taken a lot of different scriptures. I'm, I'm in a lot of different scriptures because I'm trying to um, give from the Bible what the Bible says about uh, our, our loved ones, you know, being without our loved ones. It says, brothers and sisters, we do, uh, we do not want you to be uninformed, this is 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14, about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. This passage highlights the reality of the hope that those who trust Jesus have resurrection to eternal life, has been, have been resurrected to eternal life. Many people who have trusted Jesus, who haven't trusted Jesus, have no hope. They have no hope of a good future after their earthly lives are over. When we have Christ, when we accept the Lord as our Savior, we have hope of where we will be when our earthly lives are over. But those of us who, not, who do not trust Jesus have the hope of, uh, oh, but those of us who do trust Jesus have the hope of heaven and that look forward to one day. The Bible teaches um, the resurrection of believers, which is the hope that one day both the living and the deceased will be raised to a new life in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, and 53 describes being reunited one day with our loved ones in a glorified state. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. This passage highlights trans the transformation of believers at the resurrection, emphasizing our victory over death and the celebration of God's glories, glorious gift of eternal life. I, 
I looked up a lot of stuff when I was looking at this stuff, um, and God kept showing me so many things. Um, I lost my second wife, so I uh, didn't think it was that it was bad because we weren't married that long, but it was. And I didn't realize it until I recently, in this church, got involved with a group. And um, so I started wondering, you know, what, where, where, what happens when people die? You know, what, what, are we reunited with them? You know, anyway, I started looking at a lot of things. And the Bible teaches the concept of the communion of saints, which refers to the fellowship and connection among all believers. Both those who are living on earth and those who are living in heaven. The communion of saint is based on the idea that believers in heaven and on earth are part of, some, of the same spiritual family. Hebrews 12.1 reveals, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that is so easily that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us the great cloud of witnesses includes all believers who have gone before us including our loved ones revelations chapters 5 and 8 both describe how our loved ones and other saints in heaven Pray for us. However, we need to be cautious and avoid praying for them, but instead direct our prayers for them to God. It's encouraging to know that our loved ones are supporting us from heaven as we continue our lives here on earth without them. They are aware of us, and we are aware of them. We just can't see them. Revelation 21.4 points, paints an inspiring picture of eternal state of believers in heaven, describing a future where pain and sorrow no longer exist and revealing, and revealing about God. It says he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the older things have passed away. This verse assures us that in heaven there will be no more sorrow, including the sorrow of missing loved ones. It helps us look forward to experiencing joy with our loved ones in God's presence together. When Revelation 19.9 refers to the great heavenly banquet, it says, then the angel said to me, write this, what, uh, uh, write this blessed, it said, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the words of God. The imagery conveys a source of celebration and a joy in heaven where believers gather with Jesus, experience fellowship together with our loved ones. We're going to see them again. We're going to be with them. If anybody has any questions, feel free to. <laughs> um, this is all new territory for me, so I. Uh, this is probably the most extensiveness I've gotten in God's Word in a, my whole life. So, it's uh, I'd be telling you a lie if I told you it wasn't something that really made me, you know. Um, but the Bible emphasizes the concept of eternal fellowship and unity among believers in heaven. It speaks to the idea that, only, uh, that not only will we be with God, but we will also be together with our loved ones in perfect harmony. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
and so we will be with the Lord forever. This verse reinforces the hope of being united together with our loved ones for eternity. And Revelation 7, 9, and 10 describes a vast multitude in heaven worshiping God and the Lamb, Jesus. And this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, Jesus Christ. This multitude includes people from every nation, every walk of life, pointing out the inclusivity and the diversity of those in the presence of God. It will be a glorious scene in heaven where a multitude of people from all walks of life worship together. Our loved ones, along with countless others, are part of this heavenly assembly. And we will experience that with them. The Bible provides numerous insights and promises about our loved ones in heaven. It offers profound comfort and hope to us when we are grieving. As we reflect on what the Bible says about our loved ones in heaven, we find a rich tapestry of biblical teachings that affirm the reality of heaven as a place of unity. Celebration and everlasting communion with God and our, and our loved ones, the biblical truths provide comfort and assurance after our beloved family and friends have passed away. It reminds us of the profound hope that awaits us in the presence of our Creator. Heaven is not just a distant and mysterious realm, but a place, a real place, where we can enjoy reunion and eternal communi communion with both God and our loved ones. I know I went through that probably a little fast, didn't I? I've seen a lot of death in my life, um, lost a lot of family members, lost a lot of friends, uh, some in war. Um, um, and some I knew were saved, and some I didn't, you know. Um, I pray that one day that I will find that to be the ones I didn't, that I find that I, that they were, you know. But I'm, I, you know, there's so much in God's word about, that talks about being with our loved ones and being together and, and with the Lord. We're going to be with our loved ones. And we're not going to be sad. We're not going to be sorrowful. Of, you know, we're going to be happy. We're going to be rejoicing. We're going to be uh, fellowshipping. We're going to be, it's going to be, uh, I don't think we're going to, we can imagine how great it's going to be, you know. But, uh, so when I was putting this all together, I just, uh, I didn't know where God was going to take me with it. But I knew that there has been a lot of loss in the church over the past so many months and years, you know, the past year that I, I thought it was important, including myself, I, losing someone, that uh, we understand that uh, we, have a, we have the best thing in the world that comforts us and tells us about our loved ones. It, and, and God wants us to read that and, and understand that we're, we're not going to not see him again. We, we, we aren't with them now, but we will be with them. You know, we have that comfort of knowing. But as I was reading there a while ago, there, when you're lost and you don't have the Lord and you're not saved, you have no hope when you die of where you'll go or where you'll be. I know where I'll go. I'll know where I'll be. 
and I know where my loved ones have went, you know, that have passed on before me. Um, so my hope is to t is not is everyone I encounter is to make sure that they they know where they're going and and, and know where they're headed and know where they're um, they're going to end up. That's important, really important to know where you're going to go. Wendell. brings to mind there is more than one application of the word heaven in the Bible because out of heaven came the new Jerusalem and that's where we reside for eternity I'm going to prepare a place for you there it is um, it is quite remarkable if you read 21 and 22 um, in the midst of that is Jesus Yes. Uh, Robert and I were talking about when we get there, hmm. Robert with his sweetheart, me with my sweetheart, going to the throne of the living God yes. together. Yes. Uh, I couldn't think of anything more blessed. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, we have no real concept, but God has painted a pretty good picture for us in terms of what the world has put in our minds of value. Beauty, but it's a far surpassing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, talking about the uh, the third heaven, uh, there are three heavens in Scripture that's identified. The the same word there that's used um, can also be used for uh, the sky, referring to as the heaven where the birds dwell, and then there is also heaven where the stars dwell. about uh, heaven 
but according to the scriptures, God's going to create, um, and this is, comes out Second Peter chapter 3, it says, but according to his promise, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth in Correct. which righteousness dwells. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Terry mentioned Revelation 21.1. It says that I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is yep. no longer any sea. And then it goes into the new, new city, uh, New Jerusalem. But uh, that verse I just shared, though, notice it says new heavens. So not, not just a new earth, but new heaven. God's creating a whole new universe. Right. Correct. Amen. That's Correct. the cosmos. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and what the, the most important part about it is where it's a universe that righteousness dwells. And righteousness, when we think of righteousness, God is always does what is right. Always. Right. Never does wrong, always does right. And so when you practice what God teaches in his word, you practice what Jesus says, you are putting into practice righteousness. How we are to love one another. Um, and so this is a this is a new universe, a new world that there is no sin. God's <laughs> righteousness will be filled. So I this put away. Where we will treat each other the way that we should treat each other, which is I mean, right up. And, and when you stop to think about it, God created all of creation in what six days. Well, Jesus has been in heaven what for two thousand years working on this. I mean, could you imagine? Yeah. You can't even imagine. Right. Yeah. Well, the Bible gives the dimensions of the New Jerusalem, which is huge. Be fifteen hundred miles yeah. square, fifteen right. hundred miles tall, wide, and deep, and and, and I think uh, I think <coughs> some things to mention here. We're going to be given new bodies, all new bodies. <clears throat> there, there will be a, as the Scripture says, there will be a resurrection of the dead, of the righteous and the unrighteous. In right. fact, actually, the unrighteous will be raised from the dead too, but they'll go into everlasting judgment. But Correct. God's children, they're going to go into His glory, His rest. Right. And, uh, and I, I think about that. I've pondered on this many times. And, and can you think of a time in your life when you experience a type of joy that it makes you laugh? Like you just can't help but laugh or even tear up because it's that good. That's what we're going to feel as full, a full measure Yes. Without end, I think. Right. And it's going to be forever. So. See, I think when we get to heaven, we're going to stand before God sinless. Yes. Amen. Do something we've never done. Yes. Right. That's right. So, I mean, we are absolutely <coughs> able to uh, stand before God and completely, I think, completely as, as much as possible sense, you know, the love. Just to put the contrast, which is what you said is beautiful. Moses was, hey, can I look at Jesus and God when you pass by? Or no, he said, I will pass by you and put my hand to cover your face because looking upon the face of God in a sinful state is instant. Yeah. 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 Moses, so, when Moses kind of looked at God <clears throat> away from him, yeah. God had already passed. Right. When Moses saw him, Moses only got a glimpse of, well, what he could have <coughs> used to kill. Yeah. But, um, but the beauty of the New Jerusalem is we'll look right in the face of the yeah. Oh, yeah. And it, it, and like I said, it's going to be, it's going to be gone what we can understand now, but it is something to look forward to. Yeah, the new, the new, have, the new have the heavenly Jerusalem will come down on the new earth that God is creating. Correct. And, and according to the scriptures, uh, in this city, there, uh, it says, in the daytime, there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Right. Uh, and so, like, the nations, they're going to bring in their glory. And I asked the question, like, what is, what is the glory of the nations? I would say, like, the, uh, you know, I think culture is a beautiful thing. I've been around the world, and I've met so many different cultures, and they're all so unique, and they're their language and the way they dress and their foods, it's all unique. And I think those are really incredible things that, um, and scripture says here that they're gonna bring in their glory. 
Now, you may be able to read into that, but I think some of those things that the nations have invented, like the, all the different musics, and sure. it's going to be untainted without sin, but they're going to be able to bring in those things. I don't know. That's just me looking at that and saying, hey, what is the glory of the nations, and they're going to bring it in. I think the when we get to heaven, all peoples are going to have one purpose. That's to glorify God. Yes. Yes. As Jeff said, it can be it can be through many different ways, but it will all be to glorify God and glorify Jesus. And all this that I looked at here the last couple of weeks, few well, longer than that, uh, all of it, all of the scripture here, that's what it's all about is glorifying God. And, you know. and one thing, you know, when Jesus was resurrected, as far as we know from the scripture. Had the same physical appearance that he had before he died. His disciples recognized him. So if we carry it over to those that have died in Christ, they should have the same appearance. Now they're not going to have the same body. They're going to have a perfect, glorified body. But when we get to heaven, you know, we should recognize our loved ones that passed before us. We will. Yes, we will. I mean, that's what, from what I read. In scripture, it, it, it pretty much sounds like that's the case. Now the transfiguration, when Moses and Elijah appeared, the apostles somehow, probably through the Holy Spirit, knew who they were. Yes. And they also know who they were as well. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's funny because Elijah was pretty blunt. <laughs> You know, God reveals so many things through this that I can count on. You know, and even tonight here in this room, He's revealed so many things. You know, uh, this is something that we all need to think about, and we all need to remember that it's not just our loved ones; it's our neighbors, it's the people in our community, it's our friends, it's it's all those who we come in contact with. It's just important for us to, to have that relationship that they that done, help them to understand that relationship with the Lord as it is anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting thought, too. Uh, so in the scriptures, you see that there's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yes. Uh, it said, uh, in fact, in uh, Luke chapter 13, it says they're going to come from the north, the west, the south, and east from all over. Right. And they're, they're going to enter in. They're going to sit at the table with, uh, the, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes. And uh, and there there seems to be celebration. There's there's rest, uh, reclining at the table with uh, uh, with you know as I said uh, the, the forefathers. Um, it something else that I noticed in Scripture too. I was reading one day, First Corinthians chapter six. It says, "Food is for the stomach, and stomach is for the food." But God will do away with both of them. Now, we see something. It says right here that the God's going to do away with the, bump, the, the stomach and the food. But I don't think he's saying that we won't ever eat again. We won't. Uh, uh, what I think the scriptures is pointing out here is that there's not going to be a need for it. Like, I don't need, I won't need food to survive. And clearly there's going to be eating in heaven because we see that in Revelation where the nations are eating of the tree of life. Yep. So there will be eating. You're but invited I think, to do yes, it. So yes. So well, there will be really, you know, even Jesus told his disciples at the Last Supper, you know, I will drink this, this, this wine, yeah. wine until we're together in paradise. So, yeah. so the, the, the way I interpret this then is that there's there's going to be no need for it. Like I don't have to survive on food. Yeah. But it's going to be just with the enjoyment. And it's going to be delicious too. Yes. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, even liberal tastes good up there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Did you catch that? that? Even liberal tastes good up there. I don't, I don't, we could enjoy the taste of things, I believe that. Mm -hmm. To need it, uh, did Adam need to eat? I don't think so. But he had the privilege of doing it for my choice because he's eternal. He didn't need food to survive. It was something that he enjoyed as a pleasure. Uh, 
I like eating things that taste good. That's a pleasure. The I, one thought that really impressed me the most, I can change thinking now. I like to just add to what Jeff said because I, <laughs> I like eating. Uh, Amen. The, uh, here's something that's quite remarkable to think about. Okay. Jeff, you went off this today, right? Yes, we did. Uh, if somebody got saved, wouldn't it be quite remarkable that you enter into the new Jerusalem and see somebody you witnessed to? Yeah. Yes. Well, I think it's going to be not, I, I, um, I, that's a powerful thought, but I think it's even going to be more like we're going to be able, if we go out and you win somebody to Christ without a doubt, right. you're going to see them in eternity. Yes. But I also think, too, that there's a lot of loving and acts that we do and, and kind things that we do and things that we do for the Lord that are rippling to eternity. Yes. You're not, you're not going to notice that maybe this one kind act set this person back on a path of righteousness. Oh, yeah. That would so, be, I think we will witness to each other. We have all of eternity to do that. Um, you know, a finite number of humans get saved, uh, but we have all eternity to share glory that Jesus has bestowed upon us in salvation and the newness of life and godly love that we have for each other. Wow, it's so different than what we have today. Uh, it's, uh, it's, you can't have it in your life. I mean, to the believer, death is not an end. It's a beginning uh, to, to, to a better life. Uh, you know, and, and that's what I got out of all of this is that there is so much waiting for me you know, when God is through using me here, that I, I have the hope of knowing. And today when we talk to some of those people, they did not have the hope of knowing. Um, and that's what breaks my heart, is to hear somebody that can't give you, to tell you that they have that hope. Yes. Because we live in a world that's increasingly evil, ungodly. You, you know, you look at what's going on today. I mean, if you didn't hear the news today, there was another shooting in a school. Yes. At, at, at Georgia. One at one time in our country, schools were the safest place for kids to go to. Yeah. It's not even that way anymore. We but even pray in schools. You know, our, we can read what the Bible says about heaven and what it's going to be like. That can be the encouragement for us to uh, stay the course. You know, you know, Paul. I think God, God caught Paul up in the third heaven to give him the the incentive to persevere. Because Paul didn't know what was ahead of him. All the shipwrecks and the beatings and the stoning and this all. All he had was the Old Testament and the word that was given. To no New Testament. There was no revelation. It was just Paul and God going around. Yes. So when we get discouraged, if we, you know, I don't know about you, but you can, you can, read, you can read the book of Revelation, and it just, there's, there's parts of the book of Revelation, you think about it, and it, it just gives you goosebumps. Yeah. It does. I think it's important to say. I like, I like, like, I think it's Revelation 5, is that where everyone's around the throne? Trying to figure out who's going to solve the problem. And you see the lamb in the middle and everyone bows down. I mean, if that doesn't give you goosebumps, nothing. You know, two, um, I've, I'm around a lot of, um, I'm around a lot of people, um, most of you know, sometimes I go up to Chicago and walk around. I probably shouldn't do that, but I do it. No, I have faith that God's in it. So, um, But what I'm learning is, um, and I've said this a couple times, and I'm going to say it again. Most of these people are in such sorrow and such discord 
that they're looking to grab on to the first thing that they can grab on to that will give them hope or that they feel secure with. And I would like that to be Jesus or the Lord, you know, but unfortunately we know the world we live in and so there are other things that get tossed in there that they grab on to and don't want to let go of. And so it's hard to help them understand and believe in something that they don't see that will be with them forever, you know? And so my job is to um, not, and that's why I, I paid attention today. My job is to love them back to life and to try to do whatever I can to show them um, um, like you said, that little bit of understanding or this, that, that little bit of kindness or that little bit of, hey, you know what, I just wanted you to know we were thinking about you and, you know, and, and, and if you need anything, give us a call, you know, or we'll, we'll, we'll help you, you know, the little things like that. We were out here drinking today and I mentioned that this is true. We met a lady that, the um, almost I mentioned the name of Jesus, she's like, don't, don't tell me, don't tell me about Jesus, don't shove that down my throat, I don't want it. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, uh, before I left, I said, look, you know, you've been through a lot, and she's sharing with us all the kind of tragedies in her life, and she has, she's been through a lot, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. And I said, it's okay, I'll pray for you. And I started praying for her, and just walls just drop, like, and she is just in tears, and I can really just know. And uh, she's like, I can't tell you how much I need that. So, yeah. and her son is paralyzed, and she's having to take care of him, and just showing her love, you know, like I do, if I pushed you further on Jesus, it would just be bad. I just needed to show her the love of Jesus in her mind. So, yeah, that's and it, it, it was effective. It was effective. Um, and that's what I'm saying. Sometimes that's, that, that, that's the right direction. And you never know. You might see her come to church. You know, because she really was, she was very, she even told Jeff, I really needed that. She really did. I can tell you this about Revelation. I'd been to a lot of revivals, and I'd seen a lot of people walk the aisle, and I'd seen a lot of people get saved, and I thought I was saved that, uh, until I got saved. And you don't hear many people preach on Revelation, and when you preached on that 21st chapter of Revelation, it got to me. I mean, it really did. I, I, it, it was a wow, aha moment for me. It was like I knew, you know, God spoke to me so clearly through that through that twenty first chapter of Revelation that I, uh, I I go to Revelation more now. When though I I look at Revelation a lot more, and it does put goosebumps, you know. And if I don't understand something, I go to Terry. <laughs> and if he don't understand something, he goes to Mitch. No. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I go to somebody if I don't understand. I do. Um, I'll go to maybe Mitch, maybe Rick, maybe um, Terry, uh, even Robert, even you, uh, Wendell. You know, I'll go to somebody because I do not want to give anybody the wrong meaning of God or the wrong, right, the wrong scripture or the wrong. I want to make sure that what I'm giving is true and not an opinion because I found out that my opinion is not in the Bible but Terry says it is <laughs> tell him Terry uh, doubt and deceit <laughs> and, yeah. 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 Says, doubt and deceit <laughs> <laughs> except it's laid upon yourself yes but, 
But I, I, that's what I do now. I, I, I'm listening more. I'm making myself more aware of needs of people instead of wants. Um, and I'm more grounded in God's word. And, um, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm, lear I'm learning to ask. I'm learning to ask people when I don't know something or understand something. Uh, because um, sometimes we think, well, I don't, I'll figure it out, you know. And that's not what God wants us to do. God wants us all to, to work together. Right. All to work together. That's why we can't scratch our back. We have to help each other. Uh, but no, all kidding aside, he wants us to, to do it together. He wants us to, to work together and be one, you know. And, and when we're individual, no room for individuality. Uh, we, he wants us all to be a team, work together as a team. Where the body is the body, right. It's not Catholic, it's not Hebrew or anything. It's the body of Christ. We are his body. Some of us hands, some of us feet, some of us some other things we don't want to talk about, but we are the body of Christ. So I challenge you to, you know, when you're feeling, you know, sad about uh, the loss of your loved ones, to remember, you know, uh, there's lots of good scripture in this, in this Bible that talk of comforting, of comfort, God's comfort to you that you will be with them again and that you will fellowship with them and that you will, not just your loved ones, but all people, all different kinds of, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you said, ethnicity, you know, um, all walks of life, all variations, you know, and whatever that is. And it, it can, it's probably going to be very miraculous. I, like Jeff, have been to a lot of countries with language. Um, and, 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 and I have a, a, a fondness for language, but um, sometimes I, I think it's a hobby, but now I look at it, I think God was a reason for it because I'm running into a lot of people now that don't speak much English. And um, so I'm, I'm learning that God doesn't even make language a barrier. If, it, he, if it's meant to, if he's truly in it, Language ain't going to be a barrier. What language is it not made up? All language. It passes. It's a passive language. So that's all I have. Um, I think we'll do prayer requests. If anybody's got any prayer requests, um, 